The following video builds off my previous three Tomb Raider reviews. You should probably check those first before proceeding. Tomb Raider The Last Revelation was released in 1999 for Windows and PlayStation. It would also be released on Sega's Dreamcast in 2000, one year later when Sony's console-exclusive deal with the franchise expired. Despite only being released one year after its predecessor, the game utilizes a more advanced version of the Tomb Raider engine. This time around, the team didn't want the PlayStation constraining design decisions, and would mark the first time greater emphasis was placed on the PC version of the game. Visually, the game is a big step forward in a few ways, the most noticeable difference being in the lighting department. The way it plays off Lara in the environments is a bit more natural. Though dynamic lighting has been present in every single installment since Tomb Raider 2, the more prominent volumetric lighting effects has really upped the visual game. Transitions from dark to light areas look very fluid and much more pronounced than the previous titles, greatly helped by the sheer amount of ways light can hug Lara's model. God rays, lens flares, and subtle atmospheric lighting help give the spaces a greater sense of depth. The draw distance can still come up short in some ways, letting the player see some objects popping in and out of frame, but the PC version has voided those pockets of black space that were prevalent in the earlier games. Lighting aside, the water now has a nice little particle effect, the in-game models now move their lips when speaking, and there's a greater effort to present things more cinematically than before. This was supposed to be the last game in the franchise before the team was goaded into making more titles, so they wanted the send-off to be a little more polished. In that spirit, Lara got a makeover along with the game's engine. Her voice actress, Judith Gibbons, has now been replaced with Jonah Elliott. She gives the same femme fatale performance that Gibbons brought to the table last time around, but demonstrates some nice range. Lara can sound very warm and welcoming. Jean-Yves, my faithful friend. As well as very foreboding. I'm not a man, Jean, and I'm always very, very careful. She sports a lower cut top, proudly displaying the increase in chest size, a lengthier ponytail, less rock hard abs, a slight reduction in shoulder width, and a different face entirely. I tried slapping the old one on there just to see how it looked, and I do admit there is something a bit off about the appearance. The biggest improvement to her model is definitely the way her limbs and body are meshed together. The arms and legs are better connected and smoothed out. If you check her midsection, you'll notice the side tears in her shirt are much more visible. They were there in Tomb Raider 3, but it was much less pronounced. While the lower cut top is likely just fan service, I actually do think there is some purpose to these tears in the side of her shirt. In the previous games, if Lara moved her torso, the player could see it was disconnected from her lower body. They got better at disguising it, but the top half would just sort of move independently from the bottom. Now things are properly connected, and the tears in the side of the shirt help this come to the player's attention. Her torso is now a part of her body, not a separate entity. Lara's weapon count has dropped from 8 to 6, with one new inclusion in the crossbow. The missing harpoon gun and rocket launcher aren't really missed since some of the other weapons now sport multiple types of ammunition. The crossbow, for instance, can fire standard bolts, poison arrows, and explosive arrows, making it a far more effective and versatile weapon than the rocket launcher or grenade launcher ever were. The grenade launcher does return with some improved range and also sports some more powerful variants, so it's not totally replaced by the explosive crossbow. The pistols, shotgun, and Uzis make their fourth appearance, and the revolver takes the place of the Desert Eagle, though functionally they're the same weapon. The sound effect for it is even the same, so it's likely just a swap model. The inclusion of a laser sight brings first-person aiming to the table. She can attach it to either the revolver or the crossbow and use it to zoom in and out on targets. Land combat hasn't really changed since the last installment, so this item will mostly be used for puzzle solving as opposed to headshots. Since underwater enemies are still not a big deal in this game, this arsenal of 6 is all Lara really needs. Players won't get to come to grips with Lara herself in her mansion since the crop manor is absent for the first time in the series. To be fair, the last installment fleshed out the concept as much as you could. Besides adding some more intricate puzzles, I don't see how you could add to it, though it is a little sad that the game is missing the iconic setting. Instead of an optional tutorial stage dictated at the player's own pace, this time around it's going to be handled by Lara's old mentor, Werner von Croy, in a flashback sequence in 1984 following their hunt for the Iris. 
This will also serve to lay the foundation of Lara's relationship with Von Croy, as well as explaining some neat tidbits about her history. Like how she stole her signature backpack off a dead man because that's the sort of trendy thing teenage girls like, apparently. This initial tutorial stage is handled much worse than its predecessors. The short, simple, real-time explanations of Lara herself have been replaced with more lines of dialogue on top of some flow-breaking cutscenes. You'll get access to an area with a simple task, then once you leave for the next portion of the stage, you'll enter another cutscene where Von Croy will explain another action. The saving grace for this version of the game is that these can be skipped over by hitting the look button, but some versions of the game are unable to bypass these explanations. Really, it's just Von Croy explaining Lara's typical moveset with some brief interplay between the two. It does work well for building their relationship, and sets a sort of tone that would be missing otherwise, but the frequency with which these occur is a bit much, even for first-timers. It would have helped if more of these explanations were done in real time, that way the two could have their banter, while the player comes to grips with Lara's movements at their own pace. Aside from doing what we were told here, Lara can find some secrets scattered around, which is the best aspect about this portion of the tutorial. It's training the player to be thorough and rewarding that thoroughness with something tangible. If they manage to find all the secrets before a certain point, they'll gain access to a lethal version of the next section of the tutorial. If they fail to do so, the following stage will take it easy on them. Of ways games have handled difficulty over time, this is one of my favorite ways to control the difficulty setting without simply slapping it on a menu. The developers can safely assume that people who find all the secrets are either Tomb Raider veterans or naturally good at the game, and can challenge those players a little more without making the rest feel like they're being coddled. The only new maneuver explained in this section is the rope swing. Lara actually possesses a few more new actions, but since the tutorial doesn't feel it necessary to explain these, neither will I, until Lara needs to utilize them. The existing moveset has been slightly tweaked cleaning up a few of the movements. The sprinting mechanic, for instance, works in a slightly different way. Now Lara can sprint as long as she has some meter left as opposed to the last version where she always had to let it fully recharge before sprinting again. Of the classic Tomb Raider games, this iteration of Lara is definitely the most enjoyable to go back to. The controls are fundamentally the same, but demonstrate the most polish. After Lara proceeds past the initial tutorial stage, she and Von Croy decide to race against each other to the artifact they're seeking. This section is a replacement for the obstacle course and does a much better job putting some pressure on the player to perform the skills they've just learned under some stress. The consequences for screwing up here feel far more impactful than they ever have been, since Von Croy is around to give an idea just how fast a player should be progressing. Newcomers may have a tough time with this, but veterans will know all sorts of little things to keep Lara moving at a comfortable pace ahead of Werner. The most useful of these being Lara's ability to leap up block chunks her height with a quick backstep. The cutscene following the race will alter slightly depending on if the player managed to win or not, but it always concludes with Werner getting trapped in a globe, and Lara leaving the area unscathed. I can see why the tutorial was constructed the way it was, you're supposed to feel like a student under instruction, not quite ready to strike off on their own yet. The frequent interruptions of Werner in the beginning push this point home, it's just one of those little instances of cost and benefits. I can see some players not minding this introduction for story purposes, but I personally didn't think the trade-off and flow was worth it. Again, I feel some more explanation in real time would fix the pacing, but this method does bring its own issues. Players running around Lara's home could end up cutting off her explanations if they moved around too much, for example. Our main story picks up over a decade later during Lara's expedition to Egypt searching for the Amulet of Horus. This is purely because it piques her interest over 4 for 4 and doing whatever the hell we want. Good on you, kid. She's uncharacteristically traveling with a guide who will dismantle some traps with fire. Unfortunately for Lara, being good at her craft of treasure hunting unleashes a great evil in the form of Set, god of the desert and disorder, violence, and general chaos. After reading a prophecy on the amulet that spells out how Set's gonna fuck the planet, she decides to see an old friend. Remember me? No. No, I do not. He explains the current predicament and Lara decides to go after Set's armor since it's necessary for his revival. I mean, why destroy necessary artifacts when you can just steal more and make things better in the process? While doing so, she loses the amulet to her old mentor and must strive to put a stop to him before the dark powers that be fully possess him allowing Set to once again walk the earth. This is the first time a Tomb Raider game has confined itself to one area expanding on a single theme. I'll admit that back in the day when I first heard the last revelation was solely in Egypt, part of me was a little disappointed. After playing it, however, I really have to commend the ways the Egyptian theme was explored. As far as art direction goes, this was definitely some of Core Design's strongest work. The level design manages to keep itself varied and complements the story elements as well as you could ask for on the PS1. 
there's a sense of grandeur that's just not there in the other installments that Last Revelation manages to capitalize on. If you haven't ever played this title, then know that the PC build is the way the developers intended for this to be experienced. It's a shame that the PSX version still suffered from harsh draw distance limitations. Like its predecessor, Last Revelation will lay out its stages in an a-linear manner, but it's going to go about it in an entirely different way. The game only spans over five areas, the King's Valley, Kamek, Alexandria, Cairo, and the Pyramids of Giza. Within these areas are multiple subsections that Lara can backtrack between with a few instances of the plot driving her forward to the next set of areas. This means that the amount of space that the player has to keep track of at any given moment is much higher than the previous installments. If it weren't for the loading screens that trigger between areas, players may not even realize they've wandered into a different subsection of the same map. The game institutes a more traditional difficulty curve, so as not to overwhelm the player immediately with this new direction and level design, which is definitely the right decision. Keeping on top of your ship between four different maps definitely becomes a challenge in and of itself, so it's nice that the team eases the player into the concept first. We begin in the King's Valley in the Tomb of Set, where a cinematic camera pan of the area will show us Lara, her tour guide, and a shotgun waiting to be picked up. It almost seems a little apologetic for the last time where the shotgun was hidden in a wedge a few feet away from the player. Since the tour guide needs to interact with certain elements, the pacing here seems like a tutorial after the tutorial only with more freedom given to the player. There are some little secrets to be found in the shadows and fog, and a few weapons to find off the beaten path. It's a very comfortable tomb to stretch your legs in. The guide will keep the player on the right path, and the multi-area level design will sit in the back burner for the moment. The game really takes pride in its art direction, and the cinematic Zelda-esque camera pan of the new spaces the player enters ensures they'll see things at the most visually pleasing angles. Veterans and new players alike won't really struggle with anything here. The Burial Chambers is where Lara fucks up by releasing Doom upon the planet by taking the Amulet of Horus. In terms of design, the stage follows the Tomb Raider philosophy very closely. It's a focused space of traps and challenges which loops the player around in a very logical manner. The majority of it is mandatory so the player won't get lost, but the addition of invincible mummy enemies make things a little more tense. The puzzle that may potentially stop players is the sliding block in the room after set. The box looks like it's on rails, so the players may think they can only move in one of four directions. It's when they realize that they can move it anywhere when the puzzle becomes obvious. There's a slight fix here to how Lara interacts with these movable blocks. She no longer has to reset her animation when dragging it multiple spaces. It's a start, but it doesn't save the moments when these blocks are utilized when she still drags them at a snail's pace. Also, the water coloring in this area makes it look lethal when in fact it's just the lighting. After exiting the burial chambers, Lara reads the ancient prophecy on the amulet, then gets the upper hand of the tour guide who attempts to steal it from her. Like, seriously, Lara's kill count includes an Atlantean mutant, a fucking Chinese dragon, and a space abomination. You want to betray this woman? Are you fucking high? After he escapes in the dust, Lara chases him down, murders everyone he knows, then pursues more goons by jeep. Seriously, what did you think was going to happen? Really? KV5 is a car chase. The best aspect about this section is how Lara can actually just get ahead of the car she's pursuing, beating it to its goal. Nowadays, a section like this would have the AI stay comfortably ahead of Lara, so it's good that some smart driving will let her get the edge. I found a bug in this section where Lara refused to crawl into a space to grab some ammo. I mean, the crawl button wasn't broken, but I guess Lara just wasn't feeling it. Really? You drive? chase, occasionally get down and make a way forward, and then pursue again. Reaching the end concludes the Valley of Kings in a linear approach to stage design. She does like some sweet driving, murders some more people, and then finds her old friend. She tells him she's Don gone fucked up, so the resolution is to find the armor of Horus before Von Croy, so it's off to Kamek. Yes. The Kamek stages is our first look into the game's multi-area stage design. In this initial section, Lara could wander between the Temple of Karnak, the Great Hypostyle Hall, and the Sacred Lake. Once she pushes into the Tomb of Summer Ket, there's really no reason to come back to these set of stages. The initial set of stages feel very welcoming, but it does rely a bit much on the cinematic camera pan. Any little switch or button Lara interacts with will usually result in the camera showing exactly where Lara needs to go via a long tracking shot. It feels like the level design here is going the extra mile to ensure Lara knows the way forward at all times. Pickups are also in high abundance here. The most remote bit of curiosity usually rewards Lara with shotgun and Uzi ammo. In fact, I was finding it so much that it began to worry me to some extent. 
Level designers usually don't do this unless you need to expend it all on something difficult. The puzzles can be done here in an A-linear order, but the cinematic camera will likely put most players on the same path. Really, this area just has a nice inviting vibe to it. It's like drinking hot chocolate on Christmas at a cabin up in the woods. You can just kick off your shoes, explore around for pickups, and advance whenever you feel like. It's such a stark contrast from the previous entry that it almost felt apologetic. The puzzles were also very novel. It takes a page out of Mario 64 using mirrors to show the way forward when things look like a dead end. Lara fills a turbulent lake with some Egyptian shit and walks on water. Forget Jesus. Lara fucking craft bitches. I do whatever I want. I collect a bunch of old and rare shit that fuck these temple pots. Who needs them? The actual level design succumbs to some PS1 jank, specifically in the tight underwater spaces that Lara will struggle to swim through. But ultimately, this is one comfy ride. After a certain point, Von Croy's men will enter from the hills to attack Lara. Okay, see how that works out for you. Now, I've seen my share of wacky Tomb Raider enemies, but these fucking ninjas get the gold medal. They have like the reflexes of a crippled toddler, and they can still block bullets. Fucking bullets! Out of automatic weapons even! by just like lazily moving these steel things with their wrist. They are untouchable with their clear mastery of boring weapon waving. When I realized I wasn't damaging them at all because of this, I don't think I've ever laughed so hard in my life at a video game. The level of contrivance here is astronomical. To beat these jerk offs, all you have to do is like, turn around for a second, and then shoot them when they drop their guard. Like. Oh, cool, she turned around. I could put this away and oh. Oh, wait, no. These first three subsections will be the most generous out of the game's multi leveled areas. It's an introduction of the concept, but soon the player will need to keep track of things of their own accord since the cinematic camera won't help them out as much. Really, some decisions on what to highlight and what not to highlight make no sense. Sometimes you'll get this long camera pan on a puzzle that's literal feet away from you. And other times you'll do something that affects a portion of the stage a good distance away from you, but be given no clear indication that what you're doing is actually working. Anyway, once some of Von Croy's men are laid out, a little more level traversal pushes Lara into the Tomb of Summer Cat. This stage and the following stage play out a little more linearly. Really, it's about as complex as something like Pilus Midas or one of the Nevada stages in Tomb Raider 3. Here we'll get introduced to the torches that Lara can light and carry and the scarab enemies. The scarabs will haul ass at Lara and kill her unless she's holding the torch as a light source. Even then it only slows down the process. She can't climb things while holding the torch and can't interact with the necessary wall switches, which is a special kind of stupid decision. She only needs the one free hand to activate the stuff, but instead she's forced to drop the torch and use these things so the scarab will come at her quicker. It's the very definition of artificial difficulty. Why even hand the player a torch with a mechanic that slows down the scarabs when it's just easier to forget it entirely? Besides this instance, the tomb has a rather enjoyable set of puzzles in the beginning and grips the Egyptian vibe very well. As the level pushes on, however, a few pacing issues rear their head. The biggest halt to Lara's progress is this game of... Ch chess? Egyptian chess? You, you row these tiles and then run on one of the colored spaces to race your pieces across the board, but then the computer will do this really gay shit and send your pieces back to the start. Pieces are just moving here, there, and, and everywhere. What kind of wacky tabacky is this? Once I grasped how the pieces move, you better believe I save scum the shit out of this. Just kept loading for the most favorable roles that would end the game the quickest. Apparently, there's a secret to be found for losing the game, so I actually don't recommend this. I mean, that's a little counterintuitive, but whatever. You'll stand here rolling things for a good 10 minutes or so. It's a really novel concept to play this game of battle chess against the tomb, but one that doesn't fare well upon repeat playthroughs. Once the game is over, yep, here we go. Fix one thing about the execution and you think that's the green light to utilize these fucking blocks again! Really man, you were doing just fine. Almost just fine. I don't have to reset the pulling animation between spaces, but this can lead to a new problem where you pull a block too many spaces, resulting in more block pushing than you needed to do. 
On top of this, the last revelation introduces a new bug stemming from these poles. After Lara uses one in any fashion, she'll refuse to draw her weapons unless the look button is pressed. Once you figure that out, it's just a minor annoyance of having to look around before Lara can engage the enemies fresh off a pole. Really, the summary of this tomb is that the first half is rather enjoyable, but then its pacing tapers off in the end. The Guardian of Summercut is a few short puzzles leading to a boss scenario. Lara doesn't have to shoot this thing to death, just use it as a tool to advance. You steer it down a long hallway, then make it ram into a few switches. It's a more novel approach than just a standard firefight. Exiting the tomb sees Lara making her way onto the Desert Railroad, which will take her to the Alexandria stages. It's an action-oriented stage that'll have you digging into your ammo reserves quite a bit. You'll likely discover here that Lara can simply open doors this time around since they are suspiciously lit, and the ninjas make another appearance. Yeah. The way forward is hidden quite cleverly for the stage simply being a straight line. Lara will have to hang from the edge of a train car nearly touching the ground, and she also has to check the sides of certain cars to bust her way in. It's here where she'll find the crowbar, a new permanent inventory item she'll carry for the majority of the game. It's used at random points later on, so half the battle of some future puzzles is remembering Lara hasn't dropped the thing irresponsibly. Alexandria becomes a new hub area for Lara, attaching to a few new areas for her to explore. This portion of the game is also where the difficulty curve begins to notably pick up. But unfortunately, it seems to have taken some advice from its cunty older sibling. Like if this were a sitcom and Tomb Raider 3 and 4 were siblings, the Alexandria section would be the part of the show where Tomb Raider 3 starts getting Tomb Raider 4 into smoking. It's cool, man. Uncle Phil won't find out or anything. Don't you want to be cool? Alexandria attaches to the coastal ruins, which attaches to the catacombs, the Temple of Poseidon, and the Temple of Isis. Once the player hits the Temple of Isis, there's no reason to backtrack, so really the player has five interconnected areas to work through. The way some of these spaces work off each other is pretty clever, and other times its telegraphing is pretty poor. Really, it's a mixed bag. Let's start off with the Coastal Ruins theme park, The Egyptian Adventure. If Lara wants to advance anywhere, she'll need to explore this area first. This theme park has been shut down on account of it murders its customers. It's a hall of mirrors, kiddo! Psych! Hey, son, you look a little down here. Why don't you try the shooting gallery game to practice with the scope? Psych! Blam, 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 blam! In case you're confused, I'm not complaining about the puzzles here. It's a good use of the mirror mechanic, and it does get the player comfortable using the laser sight. I just love the idea that this theme park murders you for poor performance. Solving the initial puzzles will open the way to an attic where Lara can find a handle. There are actually two pickups here, so if the player leaves after taking the handle, they're gonna have a miserable time. The other pickup is actually one of these hooks the player can pry off with the crowbar. It's an easy thing to miss, but thorough players will likely be mashing the action button against any suspicious 3D object. Combining the hook and the handle will fashion a device for Lara to grab some keys between bars. The place she can do this in is also highlighted by a suspicious 3D object. So far the telegraphing for these puzzles? Perfectly fine, but it's time for Last Revelation to pick up smoking. The main section of the coastal ruins contains a single locked door that Lara can actually open with the key she's obtained. Due to the nature of the level layout, I wouldn't be surprised if some players came here first before fully exploring the Egyptian adventure theme park. The player may swim past the sunken temple, or find new areas with some gated doors. Now remembering I had the crowbar in hand, no. I actually tried prying some of these gates open to no effect. No. The crowbars didn't work on these doors, so I eventually backtracked to the key I missed. I want you to remember that using the crowbar on this type of door no. has been deemed unacceptable. When Lara finds a gate marked with a clear keyhole, she pushes into the catacombs. Here is a section that she actually can't work through unless she enters the catacombs from a different area. This is because she needs to drag a block from this room to a pressure plate, but your weight is slightly lowering the floor. You need to head to the area underneath via a different entrance from the coastal ruins to find something to prop that section of the room up. This is a good use of interlinking areas. Unfortunately, the area Lara needs to enter into is blocked by the exact same door she encountered before with no keyhole. Really what this comes down to is now luck. If the player didn't explore finding some other doors, they may attempt to use the crowbar and find it actually works here. If you're like me where you've been denied that solution, then it's not likely you'll opt to try it again, because it's the exact same door pattern you've seen before. 
This little quirk caused an insane amount of unnecessary backtracking for me, searching for any new way to enter the catacombs. When I discovered that the crowbar actually worked on this door, it brought back a familiar feeling. Fuck off! You can't do this. You can't have the exact same door with different properties. Nothing good is going to come out of designing things in this manner. It's the type of decision making I expect to find in Tomb Raider 3. Once it's understood that you should always opt to attempt to open every door, the progression of the catacombs becomes more straightforward. It's a fairly large sprawling area that can be solved in a few varying sequences. It introduces the immortal spirits which will fly around and damage Lara unless she leads them to certain statues, and the place is crawling with skeletons that can't be killed unless they're dealt explosive damage. This is also the first and last time Lara is asked to make a jump from rope to rope, and I'm glad it's only asked of the player once because it's not the most elegant mechanic. You'll discover one of Lara's unexplained essential skills, shimmying around corners. Even though it's not explained to you, the way you discover this is actually surprisingly painless, considering some of the other design decisions in the game. One of the puzzles pushes you to shimmying against a wall. You eventually come up to a corner, so naturally the only thing to do here is attempt to shimmy around. For good measure, the camera prominently shows the grippable surface on the adjacent side of the wall, so you don't attempt to leap off to a flat surface. I've bashed these games a lot for their poor decision making, so it's only fair to highlight when they do something very well. The introduction of the skill couldn't have been handled better. The next area is the Temple of Poseidon, but Lara can't complete this section without finding four tridents in the catacombs first. The player may need this stage to understand that their exploration of the catacombs is incomplete. It's another good use of interlinking areas. All the player needs to do is head down four separate paths to place the tridents they found earlier to dive down to a new area. The only questionable thing the space does is this climbable wall here. The texture work isn't that much different from its adjacent wall, so it's pretty easy to miss this. Other than that, the progression here is fine. The Temple of Poseidon connects to the Lost Library. The Lost Library is so insanely bad compared to the other levels of Alexandria that I'm positive that one of the drunk level designers from Tomb Raider 3 is behind it. This time around, two new level designers joined the team, the two being Andrea Caldera and Joby Wood. Now I don't have any access to any interviews, I wasn't behind any closed doors, but I'm positive these two were responsible for the overall sensible improvement in level design. It was like probably their job to make sure the returning four level designers of Tomb Raider 3 didn't pull any cunty shit. Then for this specific stage, these two were likely gagged, beaten, and then shot up with heroin to keep the cops off their trail. Going back to the sitcom metaphor, this is the part of the show where Tomb Raider 4 starts doing cocaine because Tomb Raider 3 told it to. Their grades are still okay and all, but now they're starting to slip in school. Hi, kids. <laughs> Visually, the Lost Library is a very inviting stage that lends itself well to the tomb raiding concept. The main hall has many doors Lara can go through, and there's no particular order she can proceed, so this is a very A-linear stage that demands some smart decision making when it comes to progression. Since I could go anywhere, I simply opted to start on my left and work my way around the main hall. The first door to the left is initially a dud. There's a highlighted area for a scroll, but other than that, there's nothing to do here yet. My guess was that I had to find a scroll to place there. The next door that you can open on the left leads to a descending pole through some traps. Now heading down, you can completely avoid these saws by just dropping down forward, but it's ascending where the real problem comes in. They rotate in such a way that taking damage is an inevitability when making your way up. Now a well-designed trap may initially appear very daunting, or even insurmountable, but usually through some quick wit or clever movement of the player, they can easily escape them entirely. There is no way you can ascend these poles without taking damage. There's no clever solution, no way you could face, no angle you can jump that will net you a favorable outcome. Since health packs are in abundance, I can only categorize this as a nitpick, but really having a trap you can't avoid that you have to pass through is just stupid decision making. Past these saws leads to a section with perpetual motion chains and rotating gears. Lara can ascend to the second floor via a climbable wall, and then finds a steel horse miniboss. Beating it only requires circle strafing, but it's a novel scenario. Once it's dead, Lara can take a gem it was harboring to open a door to a pullable line. The camera then makes a long pan near the underwater door being affected by your action. Getting to that area, however, is another beast entirely for one single reason. You have no idea Lara can interact freely with floor panels. 
Now there's obviously something special about the patterns on the floor here. I'd wager most players would likely conclude they're supposed to open the space. But the crowbar doesn't work here, so the next logical solution is to look for some type of switch to open the panel. I say that's the logical solution because Lara has never possessed the ability to open things on the ground. This is an entirely new skill she's never possessed, and it wasn't told to the player. Due to the way these stages have worked so far, a player may end up weaving the space searching for some sort of lever to open up the floor panels. Where the corner shimmy ability was telegraphed perfectly, the ability to lift up floor panels is the exact opposite. No player, if not very few players, are going to conclude they can simply just lift up the floor here in this manner. There's not even any handles on this texture. This kind of stuff always required a lever or switch in the past. You'd have to get lucky to find this mashing action in the right spot. Sadly, this isn't even the worst instance of poor telegraphing. That honor goes to this room on the right side of the hall, where one panel on the floor is somehow supposed to tell Lara to pull out her binoculars and look up a shaft to reveal a map. Like, what the fuck? Firstly, up until this point, the binoculars are effectively useless clutter. A player may try them out initially, but they may never discover it has the ability to cast light down its sight with the press of the action button. They're just sort of there in your inventory after the time skip, and even if a player does figure out the binoculars can cast light down its sight, the flares are the quicker and more efficient option. The binoculars are an entirely negligible part of Lara's arsenal up until now. It's something that could be assumed as a way as like looking at the pretty level design or something. Even then, the look function is much quicker to use. Anyone could be forgiven for thinking the shaft is simply connected to the second floor, which the player can clearly see when they enter the main hall. You'd have to jump through quite a bit of mental hoops to come to the conclusion to use binoculars on this spot. So again, a player may conclude this room is a dud. Once you discover there's a map here, do you know what it's for? It's to tell you the position of not one, not two, not three, not four, but five sliding blocks that need to be dragged from the corners of the room to a specific spot. The worst thing about all this is that some poor soul, some poor motherfucker back in the day before video walkthroughs, dragged these five blocks around a sizable space like a slow asshole attempting to solve this puzzle through trial and error. This puzzle is terrible, even when you know where the blocks should go. So I can't fathom attempting to do this without any kind of telegraphing. Once this flow breaking section is solved, another instance of shit tier telegraphing occurs in the room directly following this one. Like your bro comes in wanting to play Bayonetta, and you tell him to play Jigglypuff instead. That kind of shit tier decision making. So the saving grace of this puzzle, like what keeps it from being unplayable in tournament, is the fact that this puzzle is solved by pressing every single switch in a circle which I have no doubt certain players tried. I tried hitting every switch at least once, but I didn't go one right after the other, so nothing happened. I figured there had to be a way to telegraph this puzzle. Something had to give me a hint on what I should be doing. There is, actually. It's that scroll in the first room on the right. Remember when the camera made a long-ass pan to a door opening literal feet away from you? Remember how it didn't show me this unobtainable scroll materialize from nothing? and how it wasn't a place for Lara to set something down? Just, just curious, why, why would a player come back here? Why would they? Without any incentive at all. A player could potentially work through the shitty block puzzle first, and then make their way into the scroll room, but given the poor telegraphing for the map, I would have to say that's very unlikely. Let, let's put a number to that, something like 153.4% unlikely. First time players came into this room first. Then you neglect to tell them when something here has been affected. Unless you called upon a walkthrough, I gambled first time players progress here by getting lucky hitting the switches in a circle, or finding the scroll is now obtainable by complete accident. You know, I really gotta hand it to them. I really gotta hand it to the level designers. You got away with the murder of your two most competent teammates. Then just managed to cram everything wrong with classic Tomb Raider in one space. It almost felt like Tomb Raider 3 DLC to be honest. It was just one poor decision after another. Once Lara is able to get off the pinball table and put her pants on, she finds Von Croy and his cronies in the Hall of Demetrius. Naturally, the progression here is Lara murdering everyone, taking what she needs to find being the key to the sunken temple, and pieces out. One of the pieces is obtainable in the Lost Library, so hopefully the player has managed to find that one as well. 
Now it's finally time to enter the sunken temple of Isis, and it seems that Andrea and Jarvi were able to escape the coffins they were buried alive in because the level design here is a vast improvement. For every trap and puzzle the Lost Library did wrong, the Temple of Isis does right. The standout ones are putting Lara into oil while showing fire slowly inching toward you. Without any kind of camera panning or any kind of cutscene, the moment where you see the fire heading towards the odd colored water gets you to put two and two together rather quickly. Get out of there or be burned alive. The scarabs also get put to great use here, and the puzzle where Lara needs to sprint across the hall flipping switches is tense in the good way. It's a little jank how these things ascend tall platforms, but it's easy to imagine bugs being able to climb this sort of stuff. Lara is hunting for beetle pieces to fashion a device to safely traverse Cleopatra's palace. Some of the pieces she can collect are entirely broken and useless, which are the level designers being a jerk in the fun kind of way. Not every old artifact Lara tears off a wall has use. The floor beetle, which disrupts the spike traps, only has three charges, which isn't telegraphed to the player in any way, unfortunately. It won't cause any kind of halt in their progress, but it can lead to some ammo reserves being unobtainable. The objects of interest here are more pieces of the armor of Horus, the first bit being obtainable in the Temple of Poseidon. I like that this stuff is spread out, leaving some room for error. The player who rushed through may potentially have some backtracking to do after this. The center of the palace throws a curveball creating a golden statue cloned out of Lara. Any harm that comes to it also befalls herself, so it's bizarre that she'll opt to target the statue once she knows the bullets will hurt her. She has to traverse upwards while defending the statue from enemy attacks. The kicker here is that the thing is actually never destroyed. She never powers down the pedestal it's on, or finds a way to destroy the thing while keeping herself alive. It's just there. There for anyone. Like, is Lara Croft giving you shit? Hey, I know of a little something that'll solve all your problems. Literally. Unless this thing has, like, some kind of range limit, Lara better pray to God no one finds that shit. She enters one of the top level chambers and sits on the throne, cause why not? Some ancient Egyptian shit doesn't like that sort of thing, but really, what chance do they honestly have? After murdering them, Lara grabs the rest of the armor, and leaves the area triggering the next cutscene where Lara finds that Von Croy has kidnapped her friend. So it's either give him the armor and allow Armageddon, or let the asshole die. <laughs> Glad it ain't me! The next set of stages that interlinked are the City of the Dead, Chambers of Tullin, Citadel Gate, and the Trenches. This isn't the final set of areas, but it's easily the most difficult section of the last revelation for both good and bad reasons. Things here can be done out of sequence, and some spaces don't even need to be explored for completion. It's now squarely on the player to explore things intelligently, because you can find yourself backtracking between areas more frequently than you should. Firstly, I'd like to praise the visuals of this set of stages. For nearing the climax of the story, Avon Croy has been made a thrall set creating some local chaos. The warm inviting environments bathed in sunlight have been replaced with more war-torn areas, a pale green skybox, and harsher visuals complementing the story well. Things begin with an immediate action sequence. You'll likely start off by taking damage and have to react quickly shooting out your opponents. The big tool here is the bike, which Lara will need to utilize to get around and solve puzzles. Turrets see their introduction, and the locusts see their introduction. The concept of the turrets could be executed a little better. Players are going to hit a brick wall with them because the only thing that can destroy them is a revolver shot to a specific point on the model. I'm guessing most players will try dumping power weapon onto them for the first time, then give up and nothing happens. Since the first two turrets you have to destroy are by explosive fire barrels, a player may think nearby explosive damage is the only way to dispatch of them. After all, explosive crossbow rounds and grenade rounds fail to destroy the things. A turret, not near any explosive fire barrels, is blocking the way a player needs to progress in one of the subsections, so a player likely won't figure out they need to crawl past it so they can scope in on its vital part with a revolver. The telegraphing on these things could be much better. City of the Dead also houses some insanely bad decision making on part of the level designers. In this room here, Lara can move a dead guy off a floor grate so it can be opened. Notice how this time it's opened with the lever, not just by lifting it up with her hands. The only reason Lara bothers to open this floor gate is due to the wide open gap here. Again, she can clearly enter this gap. There is nothing stopping her from doing so. But because it's slightly above the floor, she has no animation for entering the space. So she has to run around pulling levers so she can enter the hole from the hanging position. I really can't wrap my head around why you would design something like this. 
Lyra's goal is through this hole, so instead of just going in, she runs out into enemy gunfire and solves a puzzle so she can enter the same hole in a different manner. Making your heroine look like an incompetent fuckwit isn't good design. I'm honestly surprised I even have to say this. What good comes out of this? Really? Tomb Raider 3? Stop giving Tomb Raider 4 your cunty advice. It's not welcomed. Anyway, the lever through the small gap opens a door, allowing Lara to dispatch of the two most annoying turrets on the roof with massive explosives. To get there, she needs to crash the bike through some construction and solve some more quick puzzles underground, the standout of these being the ice spirit she needs to lure to water to make a safe crossing. The following section is the Chambers of Tolan, which houses a boss character in this brass man. The player can't shoot it to death, and they can't attempt to run past it since it halts Lara's progress by swinging the hammer on the floor. She'll fall off any climbable surface when it does. If it's like smart enough to halt Lara's progress, I fail to see why it allows her to platform up and away from it in order to trap it in the main building. It's a contrivance to make sure Lara does things in order. The player will need to backtrack here, but they can push forward to either the trenches or the citadel gate. There's things to do in both these sections, so for now let's go to the citadel gate. We find wounded soldier number 5 and he speaks of a creature that's been the bane of his men. Lara doesn't really give a fuck and just wants to pursue Von Croy. It's decided that she'll buff her bike with some added parts and assist in the destruction of this creature. This creature can't be shot dead and is insanely punishing of Lara. It spouts locusts from some of its body parts and spits fire hotter than Kanye. Standing anywhere in its sights is not recommended, and even running past it will take some strategy. The locusts it fires are a serious annoyance. There's no way to combat them, and it's a drain on your health resources. The most you can do is crawl to mitigate the damage. Successfully running past it leads Lara to a brief puzzle with two coffins and four levers. I don't know if things had to be done in some kind of order, I just sort of pulled levers and things worked out. This leads Lara to jumping along the upper sections of the building which turns into one jank corner jump, with flying beetles ready to shove you over the edge. Collecting the nitrous oxide ends the subsection for the moment, so now Lara needs to head back to the chambers of Tolan and make her way to the trenches, to collect a valve pipe from another destroyed vehicle to make a nitrous oxide feeder. The most difficult part of this set of puzzles was the initial turret blocking your path, but besides that things play out pretty straightforward. Getting the feeder lets Lara buff the speed of her bike. Now hitting the sprint button will give it some extra kick. She needs to take it back to the chambers of Tolan and speed up some half-finished stairs. Really, half the battle of this set of puzzles is just figuring out where you can go next, and if that place is even in the same section you're in. Once she speeds up the gap, she needs to work her way through this facility for a key. I highly recommend saving here because this presents Lara with her first opportunity to permanently break the game. In short, Lara needs a torch for a puzzle and she can grab it before encountering all the enemies she'll have to shoot down. I had to ditch the torch to shoot down a guy. No matter how hard I looked after he was dead, it was nowhere to be found. It like permanently clipped into the game's geometry somewhere and I had to do the section again. After successfully keeping the torch, figuring out what to use it on was more guesswork. I almost thought I didn't need it, but when the boss enemy occupying the same space kept me from going up the ladder in the building, despite not being able to see me at all, I concluded something definitely needed lighting. Turns out it's the sprinklers near the door here. I'm sure this caught some people's eye, but I wasn't one of them. This creates a way forward in a different room where Lara can shoot the destructible crates and grab a key behind a locked door. Now using the scope to shoot this thing makes immediate sense, but you're going to be pretty pissed to know that the standard pistol shot in the general direction of the lock works just fine as well. The key found actually needs to be used in the trenches, so unless you came across the locked door there first, you may not think to go back there. Once you figure out where to go, you're led to a small crack in the wall, so the only logical thing to conclude here is that there's something to shoot. Using the scope, the only object of interest I could assess here was the bright red button, but shooting it didn't seem to change anything. Turns out shooting it opens a previously shut door in the same area. If there was ever a time for a long camera pan, this was it. With the door open, Lara can use the bike to enter the street bazaar. The street bazaar begins with finding wounded soldier number 8 who gives you the detonator from the mines, but without the codes it's useless. She needs to pick up a few items here before heading up to some poorly framed gaps. It's such a jank jump here that I thought I could use the grating to monkey swing over. Turns out you can't and you're really just expected to do this awkward jump. Combining the items you find at floor level, Lara pushes up a floor panel and makes her way into an area being struck by lightning. This is the second place I recommend you save because you can permanently break your file here as well. You need to move this block into the lightning. 
place any other block in the line of fire, and the file's broken since you can't safely move it once it's placed. Getting the correct block causes the lightning to strike the bridge. Lara can now descend down into an area where she'll grab the detonator codes and utilize the Egyptian bull enemy again. This time the spot it needs to hit is a little more awkward, so it can be a fair bit of trial and error before you get it to do what it needs to do. With everything she needs on hand, it's back to the Citadel Gate, where the most contrived Tomb Raider moment occurs. Basically, Lara comes back to the wounded soldier and he decides he's going to make the ultimate sacrifice and kamikaze the very hostile ancient demon. Remember, this is the demon that would light your ass on fire for looking at it wrong from 50 feet away. Standing near it always results in death, and if you're not maintaining any kind of momentum when crossing its path, it's game over. So explain to me. Someone explain to me how Lara can slowly drag a wounded soldier directly in front of it, have a long conversation about sacrifice directly in front of it, then watch the guy slowly get into the truck and start the engine directly in front of it. Oh, did he blow you up exactly like he said he would? I'm fine with Lara, I'm fine with some of the hammy performances, but this entire thing is super contrived. It's astronomically bad writing. But it's also kind of funny. After the monster allows you to pity kill it, Lara makes her way into the Citadel, where the level design and stage progression begin winding down to a more linear fashion. Lara needs to keep an eye on her surroundings since the way forward is cleverly hidden around the walls of the area. The use of the torch here is good, and the obvious health pickup luring players to a fire trap represents a good example of proper telegraphing. Players should be a bit suspicious of something so obviously placed. My favorite puzzle here is the main hall that utilizes the compass in the player's inventory. It's something the player has seen in the lower left hand corner of the pause menu for the longest time, and the introductory camera pan of the area telegraphs its use. Even without the camera pan, the floor hints at the use of the compass. The Citadel leads to the Sphinx Complex. Of the things going for it, the steady transition and level design from normal to chaotic is one of the strongest aspects of the last revelation. Things continue to proceed in a more linear fashion, pushing players to the front of the Sphinx, where Lara will need to construct a shovel to dig. This takes her underneath the Sphinx. This portion has a good logic to its puzzles, but it's weighed down by some poor decision making. Here the player can find a sheet of paper for translating and deciphering hieroglyphics. This seems like the kind of thing a Tomb Raider should be doing, and up until this point Lara has been doing it, but only in cutscenes. You don't need this paper for any puzzles in the slightest, however. Instead, all the player needs are the orders given to them in this hall. Now that the Lost Library has passed, it's entirely fair to expect the player to use the binoculars for looking up dark shafts. It becomes the go-to item when the player sees these in the hall. The player will get several different orders for pressing these main three switches in. Copying an order here opens a gate, and heading down that gate braving the traps behind rewards the player with a key. So really, it's another repeat of St. Francis Folly. The traps thrown at the player this time are a varying success. There's one where some holes are placed below hieroglyphics, so I thought I needed the sheet of paper here. The letters above these holes translate to, from left to right, V, D, S, T, F, J, X, N, and I. Complete gibberish. I made a save, then tried sticking my hand through the hole of the lowest numbered letter alphabetically. So for the left column, I picked the D hole, then the F hole, than the eye hole. This worked two out of three times, rewarding me with a health pickup, a key, and a swarm of scarabs. Every other hole had a swarm of scarabs hidden behind it as well. I honestly don't know what the logic behind this puzzle is. The next was a complex underwater maze, which is one of the worst puzzles I've ever experienced in a classic Tomb Raider. Sure, Lara can hold her breath for quite a bit, but the maze is fairly long, and there's no air pockets. You're just gonna have to pick a direction and pray you're going somewhere, though four out of five times you're going to find a floor panel you can't open. You have to swim and die over and over until you find the one exit you can use, then begin opening the four other doors one at a time. There's some markings in the stone by the doors, but it's still hard to get a grip on where you are in the maze. Having to repeat this four times after the first wasn't particularly inspired. If you're responsible for making this maze, change jobs. Level design just isn't for you, buddy. Since you obviously had a good time in the underwater maze, how about a maze you slowly crawl through for the next one? Pick a point and begin crawling around for the key. Crawling is pretty slow and clunky, and subjecting players to it for long periods of time is not a favorable decision. The last puzzle honestly doesn't feel like it's trying. One room, hit four switches on each corner of the wall, 
grab the key, then leave. No traps, no gimmicks, really, none of these puzzles or challenges were executed well. The outer pyramid follows the dungeon under the sphinx, and the giant scorpion enemies will make sure you're introduced to the poison mechanic. If the tinier scorpions you encountered earlier never pinged you. I'm really fond of this poison effect. It's very dizzying and surreal. The initial section links to the Mastabas, where Lara will engage with a more satisfying set of puzzles. I'd also like to highlight how much better designed the floor panels are here. There's a 3D handlebar on them, clearly telegraphing the fact that Lara can lift these up. It's a more combat-heavy stage that pits her against some invincible mummies and dogs, and it takes more advantage of the scope attachment, requiring use for these gems. The doors locked by these gems contain items Lara will need to utilize at the end of the stage, where she'll need water, fire, and sand to proceed. Another standout is the See No Evil, Speak No Evil, and Hear No Evil statues that Lara can interact with. To elicit a deadly response, and I'm still wondering why the friendly option was the right choice. Anyway, the Mustabas link back to the pyramid where Lara needs to make some convoluted jumps. The way you need to proceed from the start is left, but getting there requires going right, then up, then down, then left, then up, then... I don't know, I, I was all over the place. Getting to the other exit takes you to... Khufu's Queen's Pyramids which will have a reward for players who save the soldiers being harassed by giant scorpions. This section houses something important to do, but those damn Tomb Raider 3 level designers have gotten their mitts into the game once more. Just one more line of coke, man. Come on, for old time's sake. Players are highly likely to just proceed forward to the main pyramid and begin solving puzzles inside, only to hit a brick wall. See inside, players are looking for shop keys for this room here. The pyramid houses all but one of them. The last one is actually hidden out here in the Queen's Pyramids. Somehow, this patch of dirt, that doesn't look any different from the textures near it, is supposed to somehow tell players that they can move this piece of level geometry. Didn't you know, fucker? You can just push this rock on this obvious switch and make your way into the pyramid. Wow, you sure must be dumb if you missed that. Again, nothing worth noting, everything completely normal, equals piece of level geometry you can move. I get why these games have a rep for being difficult. It's because four of the six level designers are complete trash. You work your way through this underground trial and error maze, shoot a guy to death for your last chap key, then head back to the pyramid for your descent to the battle with the god of disorder and chaos. The Temple of Horus is a weirdly anticlimactic way to descend down to an imposing boss. It requires using two water sacks to pour the correct amount of water on some weights. You need to take the three and five liter bags to create two liters and four liters, and then one liter respectively. Getting the wrong amount makes this thing mad, and then you have to shoot it to make it go back into its cage. Or do the optimal thing and save scum when you get the amount wrong. After pouring water, Lara heads into the main chamber of Set. She places the armor on him to get the evil spirit out of her mentor, and then begins a confrontation. This fight follows the formula of the Sophia fight from Tomb Raider 3. Lara can't kill a god, so she needs to platform up to safety after arming some kind of Egyptian self-destruct device. She gets as far as the entrance, spotting her now friendly mentor, before getting trapped in a moment of role reversal. So Lara dies, Von Croy's free, and the story ends. Until Eidos is called upon to create more games. Tomb Raider The Last Revelation is a very ambitious title that brings a lot of polish to the formula, both visually and gameplay-wise. There's some things that slip through the cracks with the advent of the new engine, like being booted out to the title sequence after every death, but as a whole, the improvements shine through. The game's strongest asset is easily the art direction, which manages to match the tone of the story from start to finish. It crafts a very inviting atmosphere, then pries it away as things get more sinister. Compared to the last title, I would definitely say Last Revelation is an improvement, though it's not without its poor decision making. I know that at the time, critics were getting a bit tired of these games, at some point calling the formula stale. But the four games released thus far have all strived for different things, which is important to recognize. The first laid the foundation, the second strove for a more action-oriented modern approach with tighter linear level design, 
The third strove to create an adventure that could be done out of sequence with areas that had multiple paths to encourage exploration, and the fourth attempted to see what could be done when the players had access to multiple stages at once. No two games thus far have been exactly alike, and the only constant between them has been our carefree treasure hunting protagonist. In the case of The Last Revelation, the game begins strong with some clever puzzles and beautiful visuals. As it goes on, however, it becomes a little marred by poor telegraphing. Really, a few simple visual changes would fix most of the game's problems in the second half. Maybe put some rust on the doors Lara can pry open, add some handlebars to some of the floor panels, maybe highlight the explosives on the side of the turrets a little better. Some things are just inherently bad in its design, like the trial and error underwater maze, the rope swinging mechanic, and the lost library's traps. Though some of the transgressions are particularly bad, on a moment to moment basis the game is certainly more enjoyable than its predecessor. The cinematics were a little intrusive in the beginning, and underutilized in some cases, but they certainly add that bit of grandeur that the game was going for. This was supposed to be Lara's send-off, the game that closed the story on the treasure hunter who couldn't be bothered to give a single fuck. Was this the way to go out? I'd personally lean on probably not. Tomb Raider 2 did show just how polished level design could be, and I wish more of that would shine through here. Or at the very least, the game was a little more consistent. Three-fifths of the game is handled excellently. One-fifth just lacks that extra bit of polish, and the other fifth can go fuck off with Tomb Raider 3. It's alright. Not Lara's finest moment as the cinematics intended, but certainly not her worst either.